Thanks for giving me this opportunity to share, and uh, I hope my words can serve as encouragement um, uh, to you in your walk, um, particularly for those, you know, I, particularly, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, I would like to speak to those of you in, you know, you know if, I'd like to speak to everyone, but in particular for those that have, that are Christians, that have accepted Christ, and, oh, okay, sorry. You know, so, you know, I, I hope that uh, this can encourage you in your walk. Uh, I think most of you know who I am, uh, just in case you don't, uh, in case there's anyone new here. My name is Patrick. Uh, I'm, my, my wife is Carrie, and my children are Conrad, Miranda, and Zachary. Now, I've been essentially churched as far as I can remember. My parents were Christians. My father's parents, they themselves were Christians. Uh, so, you know, right from the very beginning, I uh, went to church, we had a Bible in our house, we typically prayed in the house, etc. So, you know, you can say that I was very much churched. Um, and I accepted Jesus as my Savior when I was around 14. It was at a youth Bible camp. You know, I'm, may, many of you may be familiar with that type of story, you know, out, out at a camp, surrounded by music, surrounded by Christians, very charismatic speaker. You know, late at night, everyone's praying, it gets emotional, tears are flowing, and and you know, I, I did I did uh, accept Jesus as my savior at that time, and and I remember thinking, wow, this, this you know it's amazing at nighttime, and and you know you feel all tingly and stuff, and then the rest of your life occurs, right? And you wonder where where did that feeling go? Where you know how come everything doesn't feel brand new as much as it did that night? How come I thought that after I accepted Christ, you know? at that uh, camp retreat, I would hate sin, you know, that sin would have nothing for me. I, I wouldn't find anything attractive about the sinful life. But of course, that's, that's not necessarily true. You know, life does go on, and you are still faced with, you know, quote, real life. Uh, so, but I, so I tried, you know, as a Christian, I tried to do what was right. You know, and some things I was successful at, some things I wasn't so successful at in terms of doing the right thing. So, yes, I went to church, you know, and I have been going to church ever since, you know, ever since then, you know, almost regularly, almost, let's call it 90% attendance, pretty good attendance, you know, try my best to read the Bible as much as I can, try to pray when I can, you know, dutifully try to give regularly to the offering, you know, serve as much as you can because... You know, that's, that's what a good Christian did. So, you know, whether it was helping out at various churches at the barbecues, counting the offering, doing the nursery, you know, all the, all the things that you kind of think, well, this is what I should do now, now that I'm a Christian. And so, you know, from an outward appearance, everything seemed to be going fine. But, uh, you know, truth be told, inside, there wasn't a lot of joy. I felt I was doing these things because I guess I should do these things now. It's kind of expected of me because I'm a Christian. And with that, uh, you know, I, I was definitely robbing myself of joy. And looking around, I, I think I just became more and more cynical because, quite frankly, I didn't see a lot of joy around me. I saw a lot of people doing the same type of things that I were do, uh, was doing, but not necessarily joyfully as well. Uh, you know, pe people still we're very concerned about money and jobs and getting to a bigger house. People were still arguing with their spouses. People were still getting cancer and dying. Like, you know, it didn't seem like things were that much different inside the church than outside the church. So, you know, I think at that stage in my life, I grew somewhat cynical. And, and I really believe that one of the biggest weapons that the enemy uses is he tries to convince you that you're alone. He always tries to isolate you from your relationships, and he says, you're alone. The reason why they want you at church is because they want you to do stuff for them at church. The reason why your spouse loves you is because you provide for them. The reason why your children love you is because you put a roof over their heads. You know, they, I think the enemy is always trying to pick on your sense of isolation to say, I'm just good for this. That's why they want me here. And with those feelings, of course, you know, you're invited into a big pity party for yourself saying, I'm alone, I'm alone. You know, this is, all of this is just a show. And I, I really think that the core of the issue there was, yes, I accepted Jesus as my savior, but I didn't accept him as Lord. 
You know, I wasn't willing to trust him completely because I didn't see a lot of joy. So I thought, well, if I really want joy, maybe I need to have a backup plan. Yeah, so as a Christian, you know, I accept Jesus as my Savior. But just in case, you know what, I need to work on the money aspect. I need to work on the friendship aspect. I need to work on the whole church community aspect. I need to work on, you know, everything, all kinds of things to make sure that I can, if that doesn't work out, well, there's other ways to get joy as well. Now, I'm happy to say that about five years ago, things did become a lot better for me, and I am learning to trust in God much more. And a a big part of that was uh, Carrie's rebirth. Now, I'm not going to go over Carrie's testimony because that's her job, and I'm sure a lot of you have already heard it. But Carrie being born again really had a big impact on me for two reasons. Number one, there was definitely change in her life. You know, she, she wasn't just... She wasn't just a different Carrie on Sunday at church. She was a different Carrie when I saw her Monday to Saturday. She was a different Carrie, not just talking to church people, but talking to school mothers, talking to neighbors. There was definitely a change. And I said to myself, wow, there is change. Things do change. I'd like some of that change. You know, whatever that is, I'd like to have some of that. So there was change. And number two, it had a big impact on me because it was Carrie. I had a relationship with her. She's the person that I had the closest and most intimate relationship with. So I was getting a first row seat to this. I was seeing it on a day in day out basis with somebody that I honestly cared about and loved. And so that's why it had such a big impact on me. Now, you know, of course I'm not saying that we have all our stuff together now. Everything's fantastic. No, of course not. You know, we're still growing. We still, we still stumble and fall. We still cry and grieve but you know but we have that we we really have the new hope that has uh you know been planted in us that yes you can trust god you know you really can trust god with all your heart with all your mind with all your soul and you know i looking at uh looking at that pathway you know, it, it, we, we talked about uh, what kind of, you know, what, what is faith, and we, we recently talked about it in our youth class. And, you know, I think growing up uh, as well, I, I had a problem with, you know, confusing faith with positive thinking. You know, we kind of thought, well, if, if, if we just think that everything's going to be all right, then that's good faith, right? Like, if you think that everyone's going to be cured of their sickness. If you think that you're going to get that job, if you think that you're going to live a long life, if you think that this, well, that's faith, right? So when things didn't necessarily happen out that way, then you get discouraged. Well, you know, I, when, one of the eye-opening moments was when I realized, no, faith isn't in just positive thinking. Like, you know, that's, that's Oprah talk. We're not, we're not interested in the Oprah feel-good message. We want to know that we have faith in our God, and what do we have faith in? We have faith in our God that God is loving, God loves me, and that God is in control. And once, once we do that, I think it's so much easier to, to treat Jesus as Lord when we say, I want to treat Jesus as Lord because he is love and he's in control. I'm not sure exactly what he's going to do. I don't know what the future is, but I know that he loves me and that whatever happens, he's in control. You know, uh, you know, we, I think back to um, what Jesus said to Nicodemus when he said, uh, you know, man must be reborn. And a lot of times we focus on the being born part and everything's brand new and everything's fine and, you know, uh, everything's positive. But of course, that message of being reborn also means that the old you has to die. And, you know, that's something that we I always struggled with uh, that, that aspect that your old self has to die. You are leaving your old life in order to start a new life. And, and that's where I really wanted to, you know, commit to say, I, I don't want to live a two-faced life where you, you accept Christ, but you always want to hang on to a bit of your old life as a backup. It is so much more refreshing to just say, I, I just want to be, have one Lord, not serve multiple lords not serve multiple idols uh just to just to really focus on the the lord that uh, loves us and is in control now so you know if if you are on a similar path and if you are constantly struggling and and you're feeling discouraged you know i i hope that 
I hope that uh, these words can encourage you to don't give up. You know, I don't think that, you know, they call it a walk for a reason. It's, it's going to be a, it's going to be a journey. Nothing's going to happen. I don't think overnight. That certainly didn't in my case. I hope yours doesn't take 25 years, <laughs> but, um, you know, we, we, we want to encourage you that, at, at, you know, the foundation is that G- Jesus is love and that God is in control. And that's why we want you in this community. You know, we don't want you coming to this church because you're good with electronics. We don't want you coming to this church because, you know, boy, we could really use some more help in the nursery or gee, we could use another counter or gee, the drywall needs some patching up. Gee, we need another singer. Those things are fantastic gifts that you have, but we want you to come into this community because we want you to feel that you are loved by God. And, you know, if, if you're loved by God, I think you'll do amazing things, but we don't want you to feel loved because you can do things. You know, we don't want, you, we, we want you to know that God loves you. And when, if you really believe that, then we don't need to worry about scheduling people to do all kinds of stuff here because it'll just happen. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm confident that that'll just happen. And, you know, in, in terms of building the, the relationships that I talked about, I, I, I honestly do believe that the f- first and foremost one is with, for those of you that are married, is with your spouse. You know, outside of your relationship with Jesus Christ, that is definitely the most important relationship. It says so in the Bible, and we need to really work on that relationship first, give it our utmost attention. And I believe after that, it is the children, and after the children, it is the church community. Now, when I, you know, when I, when I look back to growing up, I went to various churches. Of course, there were lots of people in those church communities that did have changed amazing lives. I just didn't know them. I didn't make the effort to actually get to know them. And, you know, so I encourage you to make that effort. Now, you know, I, it's fine to have coffee after the service and chat for five minutes and ask how their week's gone. And it's fine to share the peace and go to a potluck and, you know, have the chit chat. But Quite frankly, I think it's going to be very difficult to make the, any kind of deeper connection unless you make that effort to say, you know what, I want to have something more. I want to have that one, whether it's a one-on-one c- contact with someone, whether it's going into a small group, you know, I, th- I think it really does take that uh, first step on your part to say, you know what, I want more than just that chit-chat. I want to have some deeper connection. And it's going to be tough in a large environment. I really think you do need to seek out that more intimate type of uh, relationship that takes some time and effort. So, you know, again, I I hope, you know, I I don't mean to, uh, um, you know, put these words as any guilt or shame onto anyone. If anything, I, you know, I want to encourage you and to to feel that you're free of uh, the expectations that are put upon you uh, once you do accept Christ. You know, don't, if you falter, don't be discouraged, don't be afraid. Remember that God promises that he'll never leave us, he'll never forsake us. And remember the uh, words of Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. He who has begun uh, good work in you will carry it to completion. Okay, God bless you and thank you.